At this time, I'd like to introduce Larry Lee and Kurt Hargis, who will be presenting our guest tonight. So let's have a round of applause for Larry Lee. Thank you guys for coming tonight. I know there's a, I, there's a, there's a ball game going on, right? You want that one? <laughs> Okay. Does it work? Yeah. Is it working? Okay. Well, um, Larry asked me to help him a little bit with this. Pass the bucket. Yeah. Anyway, Larry and I have been friends since we were uh, six years old. Um, this yeah. is be like 1954, and we used to go to the same school at Roundtree, and his father occasionally would give me a ride if it was a bad day, or take me home, or something like that. So uh, we've got a, a history. We lived about three blocks apart, Not far. and uh, we played together and that sort of thing when we were little. And uh, we were even on a Mighty Might football team. And neither one of it, or nobody in the team had ever seen a football game, I don't think. So uh, we had about two or three practices. And uh, I was the quarterback. Larry was an end. And Huey Walpole was the center. <laughs> and uh, there, were, there were days when we couldn't practice because Huey's mother signed him up to, for fencing lessons. Wow, and, I forgot. Uh, yeah. So she wouldn't let him practice football. We had about two or three practices to memory, and the guy that was doing it for us just threw his arms up and said, no, we can't do this anymore. So, <laughs> but Anyway, uh, Larry, thanks for doing this for well, us. Thank and, you for helping me. I uh, told Kurt when well, I got asked several times to do this, and I'm just not. I said, look, I'm not a stand-up at the, at the podium and talk about myself kind of person you know i said i don't know how to get up there and try to condense my life down to 45 minutes i don't where do i start where do i end what what interests anybody else uh, so i asked kurt we we go to breakfast from time to time and, and it's always so easy just to sit and talk and reminisce with kurt and i said man if, would you mind just coming up there and let's just have a conversation like we do when we when we well, sit around and talk about things. That's kind of what it looks like breakfast, only we don't each have microphones, no. you know. We, we can uh, hear each other across the table, but uh, for this purpose, this is what we're doing. Mark, when, uh, uh, when you were little, what kind of influence uh, did you have as a child as far as uh, the music in your house? Yeah. Yeah. My dad, uh, back in the 40s, before I was born and then after I was born in he used to sing on the radio back east uh, and he would be one of these singers uh with dance bands that would you know high top the uh colonial hotel and so-and-so ballroom every friday night he'd be playing and singing and so my house when everybody else started getting tvs in the early 50s my house just had a stereo which my dad played all the time you know and he introduced me to so many different styles of music. He was really into Broadway stuff. And uh, in fact, when I was like in the fifth grade and sixth grade and seventh grade, all the way through uh, you know, uh, junior high, he would take his vacations in the wintertime and he and I would get on a train down here at the depot and, and, and go up to New York City and spend like four or five days and he had all these plays we went to see. Now I was pretty young to go see these plays and I wasn't sure that's what I really wanted to do. But all that music that from, the, from the house and from seeing these shows just kind of crept into me, gave me a greater appreciation and a broader base to draw off of as I got older and started writing my own music uh but my dad was a huge influence i i i brought this just to pass around to anybody that wanted to look, look through it but uh when he was uh when he was in his late 80s i moved back here because his health was going bad and i'd spent 23 years in nashville and i, I kind of felt like i'd done what i wanted to do down there and i felt like coming back my mom had passed away my dad was still alive and i thought you know i need to come back home 
and spent some time with him because I hadn't really spent much time with him my whole life since I started playing in the band. I was gone. I was in the Navy. I was gone. Moved to Nashville. I was gone. So for his 85th birthday or something, I, I put this book together with him with some stories about what I was doing and I included all the songs that I'd written up to that point in time because I wanted him to have this so he could see what influence he had on me you know and I remember he was at the uh, veterans home in Mount Vernon and uh, I would go down there every once in a while and I'd see this sitting on his bed so I knew he'd had it out and he was thumbed through it or he'd been playing some of the music but uh, he was very influential, and I never really uh, got to tell him how much so, I don't think. Yeah. I think it was something like that. He probably understood the, the, uh, the gesture and the, and the feeling of what a keepsake that was for him. You yeah, know? yeah. Uh, great. Well, I want to see that, too. Sure, absolutely. And people um, can wander around or pass it around, whatever. Yeah, everybody would like to see that. Yeah. Uh, well, yeah. You know, your first band seemed like I heard that you were like 12 or something. Is that real? It's was that a real, real. band? Kind you of a garage were, band you, type? You were deal? talking about Huey. Huey lived just one block away from me, and I became friends with Huey. And Huey, most people that played with him knew he played bass a lot and a little bit of keyboards, but he was a really good piano player. And he would he would learn all these ventures songs, these guitar songs, on piano at his house, and he'd be playing along. And I got a snare drum when I was in the fifth grade, and I would take my snare drum up there, and a drummer will have a hi hat and a bass drum and stuff. I couldn't have all that, so I'd get a stick and I'd click on the side of the drum for a hi for a hi hat and play the drum like this. So we'd learn all these be these old uh, venture songs, any kind of uh, instrumental stuff. And also, Bill Jones lived like three or four houses from him. So then Bill and Huey and I started playing together. And I don't know how many people knew Huey's mother, Sher Lou. Uh, anyway, uh, she would have these very eclectic house parties with these very all kinds of people there. And Huey and Bill Jones and I would play these songs that for her party. And we actually had a couple of instrumental songs that we'd made up ourselves so we kind of started writing our own stuff you know at uh seventh grade eighth grade something like that what are the odds about uh, you living so close to these folks and you ended up playing music with them all my life all your life pretty much that's bill and i've played together off and on for all, you know since, that's pretty wild uh yeah. Yeah, it was just one of those things of being in the right place at the right time, which has happened to me a lot of times in my life. Just being at the right place at the right time with the right people, you know. Well, luck plays a lot, uh, has a lot of influence yeah, in everything. But uh, I think it's 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 pretty neat that uh, that you had that kind of relationship with childhood friends and myself included. Yeah, know, it's, uh, absolutely. You just you weren't playing harp back then. That's the thing. <laughs> Well, uh, moving along to the, your next big band, uh, I have in my notes here, um, the uh, I'll call them the Suit Band. Uh, oh yeah, Louis and the Seven Days. Uh, when when about did did Louis and the Seven Days get together? And, well, uh, that that happened when I got into the ninth grade. My first class of the ninth grade was. Uh, uh, band junior band it wasn't the band band it was junior band and mike bungie was a saxophone player in it yep. so he and i just sort of struck a great friendship and uh and so we uh he started playing pretty early on with the ravens i mean michael was just an exquisite instrumental player and just a great musician and so when we got uh, through high school, I'd played with Dean. I'm going to bring in a couple other people. Dean, Huey, and I played for quite a few years as the Shades. Yeah. We used to play a bunch of fraternity parties and stuff like that through high school. And then when uh, Michael and I started going to SMS, he said his, his cousin, Louie Taylor, was going to come to school down there, and Louie was a really good singer, he told me. So we started louis in seven days from that conversation so it was michael and huey walpole me well um and that kind of set your or you already had your focus kind of what kind of music you liked by then well yeah kinda i mean i like like i said my dad got me to where i appreciate so many different kinds of music i mean i go to the symphony every time they have a symphony here i love the symphony uh but um uh, 
you know, Michael and I really liked R and B, and and Louis really liked R and B. So when the, Louis and the Seven Days started, we used to do a lot of Curtis Mayfield and the impressions. We used to do James Brown. Uh, we did a lot of that kind of stuff that we really enjoyed. Well, uh, I don't know how long Louis and Seven Days was together, but at some point you got on a USO tour and mm-hmm. went to Vietnam. Yeah, the. Uh, we we were in this was about a year after we got going it was the summer of 66 and and Cy Simon actually got this for us he sent off a tape of us or something and uh, got it through the state department and the USO put us on a tour to go to Vietnam now you know we're all 16 17 18 year old guys going over into the marsh pits uh uh it was a great education for us. We, you know, like I said, we were playing James Brown and Impressions and stuff, and and a lot of those troops over there were black, and they loved that we were doing that stuff. Uh, but I had decided about the last semester of school that I, I really didn't want to go to classes, so I just went down to the student union and either played pool or went up to Romeo Bonifacio's room, who was a guitar player with in Louis Seven Days, and we would listen to West Montgomery records and we'd listen to all these great records. So I never went to class. So when I got back from that USO tour, the selective services sent me a really nice letter inviting me to go get a physical. Well, the one thing I remember from that USO tour was the last place we played was a field hospital, and we got this little stage, and we're up there, and they're they're bringing these guys out in wheelchairs, and they got casts on their arms and all stuff like that, so we started playing, and after we were done, this lieutenant came up and said, "There's there's a few guys here that couldn't come out. Would you mind coming in and saying hi to them? So we went into this tent, and this tent was something I don't want to ever see again. These kids, they were kids, my age pretty much, that were hardly recognizable. Most of them couldn't talk, but there were about three of them in there I sat and talked to, and everybody, those, those, those guys, and also the guys we met during that tour, every one of them, I know there are people here who will remember this, was, was telling me, when you go home, do whatever you have to do not to have to come back over to this place. So I get home and I get my nat draft notice. So I'm going, I'm not going to go back over there. So I went and joined the Navy for four years. Well, and, okay. and that was, you know, I just, uh, I, I don't mean to be unpatriotic, but I was just, I just didn't feel good going over there. Well, but, I know what you mean. I, I tried everything in the world to keep from it, <laughs> believe me. Yeah. And you made a good move, as I did, I think, too. But when you were in, uh, when you're in the Navy, you were stationed different places, I guess, but you were in Puerto Rico for a couple of years, right? I was in Puerto Rico. I was on a ship for 13 months, and then when I was on that ship, I was a Bolson's mate, which is like the the worst job you can have in the Navy. Uh, You know, you're cleaning decks and the bilges and painting and stuff. You know, and I'm going, I'm a musician. I can't hurt my hands, you know? And so one of the jobs I had while I was on there is I had to sort of be orderly for the officers for about six or eight weeks. And so one evening after I'd you know, put out the service food for the captain, I said, Captain, can I ask you a question? And he said, sure. And I said, what's the cushiest job that you know of in the Navy? You know, and he thought for a minute, he said, well, you know, I don't know. I, I would probably say a postal clerk. And I said, well, what do they do? And he said, I don't know what they do. <laughs> You know, and and nobody did. Nobody did. Well, the Navy, because you're really working for the post office as much as you're working for the Navy, you know. So I said, if I put a chip in, which means a request for a transfer to go to a school for that, would you help me get it through the the other ranks and he did for me thank goodness and I got accepted it was a hard school to get into because there's not that many postal clerks in the Navy uh, one per ship pretty much or one per uh, state you know shore station so I went to Bainbridge Maryland and studied my ass off because I did not want to flunk out of that school uh, and uh, Upon getting uh, out of there, my orders were to go to a naval communication station in Puerto Rico. And I'm thinking, Puerto Rico? That sounds like pretty good duty. So the last two and a half years, I was in Puerto Rico. And uh, 
it was great duty, but it also was where I really started writing songs. You learned to play piano in a church there? Well, it was a weird thing. Uh, There was this little church chapel there. I keep revolving around churches, and I'm not a very religious person, so church is like not a normal place I go. But there was this little chapel on this church, I mean on this base, and for an unknown reason, I don't know why, one day I was walking by there, and I just walked into the front of the church, and there was nobody in there, and I walked down to the front, and there was this piano there. And I never played piano before in my life. So I just went and I lifted up the keyboard and I banged on a key and then I banged on another key. And then I sat down and I put a finger here and I tried another note over here and a note over here. And I was just letting my ear tell me what to do. So by the time I left there, I had written like 20 songs. Uh, and I taught myself. I don't that know day? what. You, you, no, just, no over, over the over the course of the last year and a half that I was down there, yeah, yeah. that's okay. And uh, so I, when I got out, I don't know if I'm rushing ahead of where you want to no, go. Okay. Uh, when I got out, Bungie picked me up at the airport, and uh, I said, "So what's going on? I want to play. Well, who, where's the music? What's going on?" And he he said, "Well, I got." keys to the studio Cy Simon and Wayne put the studio together we've been cutting over there and I want to play you some stuff and I went great let's go so we went over that night and he played me some you know stuff that he and Lloyd were doing and uh, uh, and there was a piano in there and I said can, can I play you something and he goes sure so I went back there and I said I don't know if this is any good or not but I've been writing these songs so I started playing him some of these songs and he just goes well we need to record these right now. And I said, okay, I'd love to do that because I wanted to record them anyway. So Mike and I started doing these one-man demos because Mike was so good. He could play guitar. He could play drums. He could play everything. So, you know, I would just play the piano, and then Mike would just take the tracks and run with them from that point, and I would sing. To begin with, I was singing, but I, I couldn't sing with the crap. Uh, so we would do these songs, and later I was lucky enough to get introduced to uh, – Teresa Spain and I had Teresa come and sing who's she's just such a, an amazing singer so and this was in 1970, 1970 yeah and is that when Granny's was f- yeah Granny's formed yeah then? well Granny's I went to play the festival out there uh, the, the Finley River Festival with Granny's and Granny's was in a transition between a blues band which right. was just a four piece I and think back band. then and Mike wanted to get back to the seven days thing of having a horn section right. And I was back, and, and uh, he said, you want to do this? And I said, well, count me in. Uh, so we did that for, uh, well, I did that with him for about a year. I, I lived down at the ranch right. for a while. Uh, Who lived there? John R.? And John R. and me and you. Mike were in the main room when right. I was out there. Yeah. Uh, and then Don, I don't know if Don was there. Squeegee was in the middle house. Yeah. Squeegee Williams. Uh, we lived in the far one. There, was, the there far, were three houses were at this ranch. and Yeah. Uh, there are many stories we could tell about that ranch. <laughs> it was fun. It was fun. It was fun. But that's uh, – uh, did John Dillon play then? Was John was playing – I met John at that festival, actually, because that was that – was, he was playing with uh, with Dave Pease and Mike and Lloyd were, were Granny's Bathwater, the blues band. Was that what they called them back then, Chris? Oh, okay, okay. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Well, you know that. That's what it was, yeah, okay, yeah. That band is still relevant for all kinds of reasons, and as you know, they're playing uh, Friday night the 18th yeah. at the Riff here. Yeah. And it's kind of a redo, a remake, or whatever you want to call it, but... Uh, um, it had some legs that band did. It's a really, oh, well, really musical bunch. It was an amazing group. I mean, yeah. you know, I was I was just holding on to try to keep up with uh, their abilities. I was, you know, I'm I'm just an average drummer. Well, perhaps. you learn pretty quick. Well, well <laughs> yeah. Well, what about uh, when we get past that? Uh, about that time, the the uh, the new Bijou Theater started and. Uh, uh, we can talk about that for the, the, you know hours, yeah. but uh, uh, 
Mike worked there for me and Steve Canada. We were the the owners and builders of this place. And uh, was that your last real job? Well, you know, yes. Actually, it was. <laughs> it might have been even my first real job. You know, when, when I... Uh, I kind of got to the point where I was going, you know, I, I wanted to move away from the ranch for for several reasons, you know, and also uh, the band, uh, the, uh, I wasn't sure I wanted to stay doing what Granny's was doing, you know, and, and I'd kind of taken Lloyd's place and I felt a little weird about that. So Lloyd kind of snuck back in and uh, I just didn't ha really have anything to do, but I was still at the ranch and I remember that Canada came out one day and he said, I'm going to get together with Kurt and we're going to do this, we're going to build this club, you know, and I think you guys asked me if I'd be interested in being a carpenter or anything, because that's what I did. I mean, I helped him actually build that place, me and Grassler and yeah, Fuzzy. Fuzzy, Fuzzy. Yeah. <laughs> I don't know who Fuzzy was. He but was he a was main a, carpenter. He was a good, good, a yeah. good guy. Yeah. Um, the... Uh, uh, well, when Granny's was a house band there after we got it going, and Dylan played on Thursdays, um, could you make a living then doing what you were doing, working for working for the club for you, and playing? Because you paid so well. <laughs> No, it, it's free well, beer, back man. then you know we did, the t back then you didn't need a whole lot of money. I mean, I. I was living rent-free with uh, John Glidewell. I don't know how many people might remember I John remember Glidewell. John. And uh, who else was living? They rented a little house at Cherry Street in Donaldson. And they let me live in the attic. So I lived for free in the attic for several years. And besides working uh, at the Bijou, well, actually, it was after the Bijou, uh, where was I going to go with this? I'm sorry. I kind of lost well, my train of thought. It's a, the band got together at the Bijou uh, with you and Randy and John mm -hmm. trading licks and mm -hmm. trading songs and whatnot. Uh, uh, you practiced there in the afternoon. And, and I guess uh, you played with the, with the grannies at the same time, right? Well, I played a little bit with them, yeah. Yeah. I, yeah, I kind of got lost between you and, and Lloyd, really, I, because you changed uh, uh, positions so many times that I couldn't quite remember uh, uh, I who, can't re who was I mean, on I drums I think I when. played with Grannies on, at the Bijou a couple of times, but mainly it was, uh, you know, the starting of the Daredevils because, uh, you know, the, the, the way that really happened was I was bartending at the Bijou, and one afternoon, Randall came in and sat down at the bar, and we just started talking about songwriting, blah, blah, blah. And I didn't really know Randall that well, but I'd seen him play with, what was your band? Shorty Dunn. Shorty Dunn and several other people around town. But anyway, he said, you know, I know you write songs because he'd heard songs I'd written with grannies. And he says, I've been writing some songs, and I was wondering if you would listen to some of them. I said, sure. And as you know, in afternoons at the Bijou, no one was ever there. So we slipped out to his car, and he put a set in and played me uh, five or six songs. And there were a couple songs in there. I thought, man, that's not bad, what you're doing. Uh, and, and he said, well, you know John Dillon? And I said, yeah, I know John. He said, well, I know he writes songs, and you write songs, and I write songs. Why don't you think we could get together and just kind of – play each other's songs and kind of get some feedback from one another so our first meeting was actually in your office john john came and randall came and i came and we sat in your office and played well when you you got some tunes together and canada taped them in our uh, sound booth and uh, this was these that tape or those tapes were the ones uh, taken to john hammond yeah and he was president of cbs records Is yeah that right in new york you know how uh uh, Steve was just this wonderful personality that he could talk his way about any place. He was a visionary. He and was, all and he was things. up in New Jersey with uh, his wife and, and 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 Holly, visiting her parents, and he had this tape with him, and he just called CBS Records to John Hammond Senior's office and got talking to the secretary. And Sweet talked his way into being able to come up to the office and bring this tape of this unknown group of guys. And so he did, and 
he got a phone call about three or four days later from the secretary, and she goes, I don't know what you gave him, but he just will not quit playing that stuff. <laughs> you know, and she, he says he wants to know how he can get a hold of that band. So Steve uh, gave John's secretary, John Hammond's secretary, Dylan's phone number. And Dylan just got a phone call from out of the blue from this secretary in New York City, John Hammond's office, saying, we're interested. John wants to send somebody down to record you guys, wants to talk to you about playing, with uh, about your band. And John's going, band? What band? <laughs> because we never really came to be a band I mean we were just some songwriters playing on a Thursday night at a club you know uh, but uh, so they sent this producer down from New York and uh, he wanted to come into the recording arts or whatever that place was what American artists uh, we rented it for uh, five hours and he just wanted to cut like four or five songs well we're going well, no, we're not going to do that. We've got 40 songs. So we essentially just rolled tape, and we recorded like 20 songs, I think, that day. So he took them all back to CBS, and uh, then they called back and said, uh, we're really interested in this, but we're, we're not set up as a corporation to talk to you, band. We're t we need to talk to an attorney and a manager. You guys got to go get a manager and an attorney. So that started us down that whole thing. That's when Paul Peterson and yeah, Stan Plesser and yeah, Good exactly. Karma and all yeah. that. Well, then you changed your name, right? In October. Well, we, we, we had were, to. Kind our of. first gig, which was a great gig, yeah. our first gig was at the emergency, uh, the psychiatric ward of St. John's Hospital. <laughs> it was. And that's where we also met our one of our future roadies, was, was a patient up there. Uh, but. You know, we were for that gig. We we call ourselves the Emergency Band, and then we were the Burlap Socks, and we were we just we didn't take ourselves seriously, obviously, and uh, so yeah, we, we yes, we were several names. Well, you played uh, then. You played at a like, Cowtown Ballroom after that. After you had uh, met David Anderley and and Glenn Johns yeah. and A and M Records and. Uh, um, they signed you in May of 73, I think it says, and sent you to Olympic Studios in London for your first recording, uh, uh, your first album recording, the Quilt album. Yeah. Uh, talk a little bit about uh, being in London from uh, Springfield, Missouri, your first uh, your first trip abroad uh, yeah, with a guitar and a drum set or whatever. Well, it was. that whole thing from the time that you know we got a phone call from New York CBS Records to going and getting a manager and like any good manager, what happened is he took that original tape CBS made and made the rounds in L.A. to all the labels. So, you know, Warner Brothers came to see us, Atlantic came to see us, several labels came to see us, but when. When Glenn Johns came to see us, it was a whole nother thing because that's you know that was a very big deal to have him come and see us. And we were really nervous, and the, we played. And after the show, we went back up to the dressing room, and, and and Glenn was very matter of fact. I mean, he would tell you exactly what he thought, you know. And he said, "Look, I think you guys are. I love you guys. You're extremely." great characters i enjoy being here with you today but to tell you the truth watching that show you just did i just don't hear it and he was the eagles first yeah first well producer. them and the beatles and stones and right. everybody else they worked with yeah. you know so our manager said listen that wasn't really good representation of them because they were nervous and you know it was a big we were playing in front of poco or somebody uh he said why don't you come back to the office and let you let hear them the way I first heard them which was just sitting in a room playing their songs so we went back to his office we set upstairs got our acoustic guitars out and started playing and we played one song maybe two songs and he just had this big smile on his face and he says look you don't have to play anymore I want to hear more but I want to do this that is going to so work right? this is going to work I'm going to go back with David to New York, to LA and tell A&M to sign you because I want to do you at that point in time Glenn was such a powerful man he could go to a record label <clears throat> and just say I want to do this act and they would go okay cool we'll sign him so that's essentially what happened right well uh, um, 
the Quilt album was released in 73 in December. And if you want to get to heaven, it was on there. It was a top 30 hit. And the second album, October 74, was recorded at Rudy Valley Ranch. Up, where was that, north of Aldridge? Yeah, up by Aldridge, yeah. And that's, uh, It'll Shine When It Shines is the name of that. And that's where Jackie Blue was fitted in. Um, we could probably spend a couple of weeks talking about Jackie Blue. But uh, it reached number three on the Billboard chart. And number one on the singles charts of Cashbox and Record World. Um, talk a little bit about... Uh, Glenn Johns suggested a little change in uh, in what it was the subject well, matter of that. The thing, yeah, we were recording up there at the ranch, the old the old uh, Rudy Valley Ranch, and uh, we uh, the lady that's on that cover, you you know the cover of that lady that's on there, kind of doing one of these things. She was our cook, Jim Mayfield's picture. Mayfield's picture. Right. She was our cook for that. And so one night after dinner, I went into the room where the piano was, and I was playing this little dum 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 thing that had some lyrics for it, but I was just playing it because I liked it. I didn't really think to present it to him for the Daredevils because I didn't sense that it was really a Daredevil song. Well, it was a lot different. It was completely so different, different yeah. than everything else we were doing. You know, but Glenn walked by and said, what is that? And I said, oh, it's just this thing I've been working on. And I played him, dum 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 ooh, Jackie Blue. And he just tapped me on his shoulder and he says, that's a hit. We're going to do that tonight. Well, he had a good sense, didn't he? Well, he did have a great sense because, he, you know, that's why he is who he is. That's why he's uh, in the business. Well, he, that's why it was so popular. If it was popular with him, it would be popular with everyone else, he well, thought, right? Well, I guess so. I mean, <laughs> It, and how many plays to date on the radio? Do you got any idea? I have no idea. And several years ago, BMI gave me a plaque for a million air plays. So, so that was quite a long time so ago. So like 25 million now? Maybe something like yep. that. It's played every day somewhere, you know, it several is. times. Uh, yep. If you listen to the radio, you'll hear it every yeah, day. Yeah. Yeah. Um, well, do you think that kind of pigeonholed you for a while? Maybe still does. Does that define you as a as a writer? Do you well, think? no, because I agree. No, not really. I don't think. I, I mean, it was just it was just a song. It, you know, it was. I've got hundreds of them, uh, and it just happened to be the right song at the right time. Uh, it, it was good for the band, and it gave it a lot more longevity. But I'm not sure. It, it's it's really a daredevil song you know what i'm saying i mean in the context of a lot of the other stuff that we were doing right you know well uh, i've got a quote here that Kennedy um, spoke about one time he said jackie blue appealed to an audience that wasn't familiar with the band and weren't necessarily interested in the daredevils beyond that one song so yeah. you know that uh, there was a there are fans out there that like that song that didn't care about the band absolutely so, yeah uh, you were with that band for 10 years right those are mountain daredevils uh nine albums i think that's right uh you left in 1982 uh is that about when the end of the major labels came about yeah part of the reason that i left was that um you know we'd had this really cool career going you know we started in a van cruising around playing high schools in kansas city and st louis trying to get our our base going you know and then if you want to get to heaven came out and then we got tours with the doobie brothers in chicago and loggins and messina and we were out more than we were home uh and then jackie blue came out and then we were you know had our own plane and we were flying around doing all kinds of stuff and we were gone all the time uh and then we kind of the career kind of started going like this and you know we went from private planes to buses i liked the bus then no i did the buses were better because you can see the countryside going by airport you know when you're on a plane all you see is airports and holiday inns and you do that for about three or four weeks and you get crazy in the head you know uh, so uh so about the time i went started going to nashville uh we were creeping back into the van 
and I was going, you know, I've been down this road, and I know where this goes to, and uh, I, I didn't see, I didn't see the energy level for every with everybody to like, you know, s- step up and get kind it going time, again. Time for you to go. Right? And so, and John going, bless his heart, such a great player and great friend of mine, had moved to Nashville. And said, why don't you come down here? I'll introduce you to a bunch of people. So I started going down to Nashville and writing with John. And then uh, also staying with Norbert Putnam, who was a friend of mine, a producer of Dan Fogelberg, Jimmy Buffett, a bunch of people. And he, so I would go down there, and he would just give me the keys to the studio. And John would call in all these great players that he knew down there. And we started doing these song demos of mine that John and I wrote. And I finally went, you know, I feel so much more intense energy down here than I do in Springfield. You know, I'm, I'm not getting, so I, I I just packed up and moved. Well, you you broke a lot of hearts up here. Well, I you know, know there was there was uh, rumors, you know, Larry's getting back with the band. You know, Larry's going to play some more with the band. And we heard that for years, you know, and there was high hopes for that, I guess. But well, um, John Dillon wrote a deal about you. Uh, or told me, uh, and this would be a quote, I guess. It said, Larry's a black keys guy. Yeah, I am. Very technical. He was <laughs> dedicated to the principle of the band and stayed through it all. The band has nothing but respect for him and his camaraderie. He was the most accomplished musician of all of us. So that's well, a, that's kind of him. I mean, one of the things about the Ozark Mountain Daredevils, and I want to slip back to Granny's for a minute, I felt a little guilty, actually, because Granny's was such an amazing band, great musicians, and I kept going, why aren't these guys getting deals? Why why don't they get a deal? You know, and then these weird little hippie guys from, you know, that don't, didn't even try to be a band. We all thought that. You know, all of a sudden become, all of a sudden get out there and they're all over the place, and, and I felt a little guilty about that. <laughs> <laughs> well... <laughs> I, we all understand. Yeah, I, yeah. I, we've all thought about that, I think. But <laughs> <laughs> when you got to Nashville, you were, you were a staff writer for a publishing company. Mm-hmm. This is 82, and you yeah. did session work, as you just mentioned. Uh, why uh, the session players don't get royalties, is that right? No, you just get a fee to go play. Yeah. You know? So. And I didn't do a whole lot of that. Uh, I, I did. I, I sang some background with uh, Rita Coolidge, and I sang some background on... I can't remember. You know, a handful of things. Uh, Mainly I was trying to get, I was trying to concentrate on writing songs. And it was kind of weird because John and I were writing these really pop, Euro pop songs in Nashville. And uh, the musicians down there are so good that they love playing all different kinds of music, not just hee-haw music. Uh, So they were, uh, we had great players play with us. And uh, John and I, started going to New York and we would go up there and work in studios there and cut our songs and go hit a few record labels and then we we did six weeks or so out in LA did that too trying to get a deal for us as a duo with our songs uh, but nothing ever came of that and uh, then about 85 or so uh, I was doing uh, some backgrounds for Jimmy Buffett and uh he called me about six months later, and he says, what are you doing this summer? And I go, I don't know. What do you got? And uh, he said, well, Timothy Smith been playing bass for me, and he's going to go back to the Eagles, and I need somebody that can sing those high parts. Would you want to go on tour with me? And I went, well, yeah, because, you know, it's like a big chance for me to get out of town for a little while a and deal. make some good money, too. Big band. Uh, and so we uh, – we went down. I went down to Memphis and rehearsed for a, a week down there on his show. And he said, "Man, would you mind doing Jackie Blue?" And I went, "Well, no, I wouldn't mind at all because it was a great band he had, you know." And he said, "Great, it'd be great if you go. We'll do. We'll, we'll add it to your set." So that didn't last long because the very first gig we played was St. Louis, and then the next night we played Kansas City. And then we played in Oklahoma, and Jackie Blue got as big, if not a bigger, reception than Margaritaville did. <laughs> you know, and and that was just because I was in my backyard. You know right, what I'm saying? Right. So, and Thank they were going, "Wow, they're going to play that song, and that's that guy singing it." And blah blah blah. Uh, 
So we played about four more shows, and we got down to Atlanta, Georgia. And uh, Jimmy, one of the reasons Jimmy hired me to go play is because I play golf, and he loves to play golf. So we would go play golf every day we had off. And we went to the Atlanta Country Club to play golf at one day. And you know how hole-in-ones are. They just sort of happen. I get a hole-in-one. So, so uh, I get a whole lot of attention at the golf course. And then... Uh, topped off by we get to the limos and the guys are these limo drivers are coming up to me wanting my autograph with Jimmy sitting there so that was a little uncomfortable I felt bad for Jim and so I get to the gig that night and the road crew's coming up and going man really good man you got a hole in one he's gonna be a real shit to work with tonight <laughs> you know and, and sorry for my French uh, but uh uh, I don't want that to be a bad light on Jimmy Buffett because he's a wonderful guy. He, he saved my life I'll there for it a was, while. I'll and it was a, a huge playing playing on stage with Jimmy. The, the the show is the audience. Anybody that ever goes to a Jimmy Buffett show knows what that's like. So to be up on stage and playing with him at night and see just thousands of people out there just going completely crazy, it was fun. Did you get uh, Did you get a, a couple of songs for Dylan and Cash on a record of his? Not on his. I got a song of theirs on Alabama record. When I on Alabama. Alabama. Okay. Yeah. All right. Well, I get my That's wires okay. crossed That's here. Okay. Uh, well, I just watched a little Buffett yesterday, and he was at uh, the Newport Folk Festival in 08, <laughs> just after you left. Uh -huh. And it looked like a hoot. Um, oh, yeah. Uh, and uh, the musical, if you don't know, Margaritaville, Margaritaville is a musical. And it's going to be playing here in Springfield here this year, this summer. Is that right? Is it? Yeah. Really? That's what it says. Um, but you know, anyway. Can I say one more thing yeah. about Jimmy Buffett? Yeah. Is one of the things I, I got from him, because he said, you know, you think he's so entertaining. He's such a good entertainer. One of the things I watched about him was he would go into a town and he would get a newspaper and he would call the newspaper or something like that and he would get some tidbit of what's going on in town like there like there's a you know the the mayor's having an affair and he's going to get kicked out or something so he would have something in any city that he could talk about that everybody out there would go ah yeah he knows about this he knows about our place i mean he just puts a lot into it he's a yeah. he's a wonderful entertainer well, that's a good showing yeah it is well you produced uh, the buffett band and uh, juice newton restless heart in alabama uh, multi-platinum albums and 13 number one singles yep uh, 13 albums for Buffett, 13 albums for Alabama. So no, thir no. 13 is lucky for you? I don't know. Maybe. Is that right? That's the last Daredevil I worked on. Daredevil, I, I, I was well, 13. There you go. <laughs> well, I'd be betting on 13 if I were you. Um, and I read somewhere where you got uh, 38 production album credits and uh, the Quill Award for in the Writers Hall of Fame. Right. Um, well, along about 89, you formed another band of these session guys. Yes, the, my uh, friends in Nashville. The friends in Nashville, the Dell Beatles. Um, Josh Leo was in that, in that group, I guess. Um, and you had quite a following in Nashville. And at some point, you changed the name to Vinyl Kings. Yeah. Well, and, what happened uh, was uh, I, I met – I got to be good friends with Josh – on the Buffett tour because he was playing guitar in the Buffett tour and he just moved to Nashville Wendy Wallman I got to meet her in Nashville when she first moved down in there from LA and she and I started doing background vocals together so this group of people kind of started moving down to Nashville from LA uh, and we started referring to ourselves as the L.A. Aliens. We would get together and have dinners together. Uh, Kath Mateo was a good friend of ours, and we'd have these wonderful family dinners together and sit around and play, tell stories. So Josh and I and Jim Photoglow, who now plays bass for the Dirt Band, and Harry Stinson, who now plays drums for Marty Stewart, and uh, Larry Byram, who was in the original Steppenwolf, and Michael... Rhodes, who's a bass player, has played with everybody. 
So we put this band together called the Dell Beatles because we wanted to play Beatles songs. So we started playing in clubs. Our first gig was in the Bluebird Cafe for Amy, who owned the Bluebird Cafe. And Amy never had anybody come in there to play uh, cover songs. It was like songwriters or nothing. But she allowed us to come in there one night and we we packed the place and it was a really good band. We did some, some amazing covers of Beatles songs. Uh, and then uh, a couple of years later, we uh, Josh had written a few songs that he thought were kind of Beatley. And he said, "Let's get the band together and go in the studio and cut these songs," which fired all of us up to write more songs like the Beatles. So we ended up doing this album called uh, "A Little Trip," and we called ourselves the uh, Vinyl Kings because we we couldn't use Del Beatles because we would have got sued. That's, that's an ass. It's skippy They'll give you a little idea of what the Vinyl Kings were into. It was, it was like do, we wanted to pay tribute. I mean, on the on the CD itself, we say, you know, you we thank them, essentially. Thank them individually and said, you changed our lives. What did Ringo say about them? Ringo loved our record. Right. Yeah. Um, well, he left Nashville in 2006, and he came back to the Ozarks. Bought a house in Ozark. Yep. Uh and it felt like home pretty quickly compared to Nashville for you. Well, yeah, I kind of, like I said, I kind of done what I wanted to do down there. And, you know, I was feeling the urge to come back, spend some time with my dad and, you know, reacquaint myself to the band and my friends, you know, that I'd known all my life. And... Uh, you kind of teamed back up with with Randy Chowning and... Well, Randall moved back shortly after I did. Yeah. And we played a few sh few things with the band. We did that revival thing uh concerts down at the gilloys oh yeah and uh and up at steelville up at uh wildwood we uh -huh. did a couple of those uh when you put out a couple of records we did too. a couple of records yeah. he and i did a record in nashville he called me one day and said look i'm down here i'm trying to write country songs i'm trying to get covers but i'm not having any luck he said, "Would you just would you mind listening to what I'm doing and tell me if there's anything I could do to get some cuts?" So he played me these songs, and I go, "Randall, your problem is that these are Randall Chowning songs. They're not Garth Brooks songs, or they're not Alan Jackson songs." I said, "You you write like I write. I write for myself. I don't write for anybody else. I you know if I like it, I write it." And I said, "You're you're the same way." And I said, "I I could help you." put a pedal steel on this or something to try to get somebody else to cut it but i said what you ought to do is just do your own record so he got some publishing money from his publisher and i helped him start a record and we got about halfway through and he said don't you have a song we could do together and i i did so we did that that's what ended up being that first beyond reach record mm -hmm. Well, that's you're. Uh, that's kind of what you're doing now with the Higley Wheels. Correct. You're writing your own uh, for yourself. And well, uh, I've always done like that. it or not. You right? know, when I first moved to Nashville, I tried to do the the songwriting thing down there, which means you co-write a lot with with people you may know or may not know. Uh, you go to an office and you sit there and you're supposed to write a song. I can't write songs that way. You know, I've got to be inspired by something. Uh, you know, I just I'd never had much luck doing doing that. Uh, so 
you know, my whole life has been, I'll, I'll write a song, and the only reason I write it is because I want to write it. You know, if it gets, if anybody else ever hears it, I mean, this thing is full of songs nobody's ever heard. Yeah. Well, you, you got a lot of songs. Um, but I have heard the Higley Wills, and I'd encourage you all to uh, step out there and see them. It's uh, Emily Higgins and Dave Wilson and, and, uh, and the, Larry Lee. It's it's really, really fun. I'm, it's, it's I'm enjoying music. it. Yeah, it's well, real. it is. It's all We play all acoustically, and uh, David's writing really good songs. Emily writes really good songs, you know, and we're, we sing pretty good together. And, uh, and, and the main thing I like about it is we're not loud. <laughs> Well, with age, do you think there's a more wisdom or more question in your songs that you're writing? Oh, I, I think, you know, I've always thought that for me, songwriting has always been observation and then contemplation. You just see something, you watch somebody, you watch something, and you think about it, and you see what that does to you. And, uh, you know, now I'm writing more reflectively, I guess, probably, because I'm 72 years old, you know. I'm not, I can't write, you know, uh, shallow love songs. Not that love songs are, should be shallow, but you know what I'm saying? I, I have to write something that has, to me, some substance and means something to me, mm -hmm. you know. Um, how's your ears after my 60 ears, years my of My ears are okay. I've got some tinnitus and I've lost some high end. You know, uh, I used to, I engineered a lot also when I was in Nashville, and uh, I loved, I love making records. That's one of my favorite, besides writing songs, being in the studio and making, making music in the studio and being able to hear it come back has always been like a great joy to me. Uh, I don't think I would trust my ears to engineer anymore, uh, but I mean, I can still, I hear well enough. Mm -hmm. Well, um talking about uh, radio it, there's you can't really turn the radio on and find r good music anymore like you used to uh, uh does NPR does <laughs> well does radio or the record companies dictate play well radio did for a long well it's been it's been weird back in the 80s and stuff when i was going out when i had my solo album and they were shipping me all over the country to go to radio stations that was an education too uh because there was still a lot of pay for play going on under the table uh so i would go in and they would take me into some radio station in cleveland or something and go hey this is larry lee this is his new single and they go hey great yeah, let's, let's listen to it, blah, blah, blah. And then they were going, yeah, but we're going to, uh, we don't want you to start playing that yet. We need you to play the new Crowded House record or the new something or other. It was very political going on. Uh, and uh, I'm not sure if radio should dictate what record companies do because uh, I think that's why we've lost so much of the kind of music that I think we used to make. I mean, I watch. I, I don't. I can't listen to radio too much. I can't listen to country anymore at all. You know, I, I felt a little weird down there producing country records because I'm a pop guy. You know, and uh, I might be guilty of of instigating some of that that's happened down there. Uh, but now, country music is just pop music with a fiddle on it. You know, and it's uh, the lyrics are just so stupid. <laughs> Amy Lou Harris uh, had a quote I read the other day that says uh, she wants to make uh, music that makes the future better. And that's her endeavor. Yeah. Uh, and your, so maybe not your last song, but what gets said from here on out, maybe uh, in your future songs or maybe your last song, what do you envision there? I don't know. You know, uh, I'm pretty healthy right now, you know, and but I am 72, and you just never know when that day is going to happen. So I just like to, I just try to concentrate that I pay attention to every moment that I can of every day, who I'm with, what I'm doing. And, uh, you know, I think songs that I'm writing now, I just finished a song called uh, From the Hills of My Home, which talks about being here and what this place has done to me. So I think it's more reflective now. You know, and uh, there's a great Bob Dylan quote I heard him say one time about 
somebody asked him about, so what's, what, what are you doing? What are you going to be doing? And his comment was, I'm always in a constant state of becoming. And I thought, that's the perfect thing to do. Right. You know? Right. Stay, con- stay leaning forward. Well, um, I hope you provide more guidance for us here as far as uh, uh, as you're leaning forward. Thank you, but, uh, if there's, uh, there's questions, I think you're going to take some questions here. Go ahead. Questions? Okay, here we go. One, two, three. Hello. <clears throat> okay. Is it, hello? Yes. Uh, Larry, is it true that uh, after she did such a good job on the Beatles that Yoko actually broke up the Daredevils? <laughs> <laughs> I don't know about that one. I haven't heard that story yet. No, no. That's right. Thank you so much. It's been great fun. Can you tell us, uh, for the folks in the audience that don't know, where the Higley Wills will be playing here locally next? Yeah, we're going to play down for Jeanette and Bruce down at the uh, Rock House in uh, Reed, Springs. Reed Springs next month. Oh, good. Yeah, and then we're taking the winter off because we, we took the last winter off just because Emily moved to Houston and, and yeah. doesn't want to really drive, you know, be connected, have to do a gig if the weather's going to be bad. Exactly. And so we've kind of dedicated winter to time off and, and a time to write. And we wrote a lot last winter. We're doing yep. a lot of songs. In fact, David and I, were, David's our list guy now. And we're, we've got so many songs, we can't do them all at night. So we're having to leave things out that we really want to do, which is a great problem to have. But uh, I don't know how many of you got to go. We played at uh, Washington Avenue. And what a beautiful venue. And well, there needs to be more concerts like that. More listening room situations around town would be really good. Hey, Larry. Hey, buddy. Uh, what were the two songs that you uh, played acoustically for Glenn Johns? Uh, I think we probably did uh, Beauty in the River. Uh, we played several that night after he said, uh, you know, I want to hear more, but you, you have my attention and we're going to do this. Uh, but back then, we you know we had we were playing Black Sky, we played uh, Stand on the Rock. Uh, I think I probably did uh, maybe Within Without or Spaceship Orion or something like that. You know, I I love that band. I mean, you know, we wrote some. There were some very cool things we did. But kind of hard to put us in a category, which was our problem. I got another question. Sure, man. What was the inspiration for Jackie Blue? Because I know I heard it was for a guy, not Jackie Blue. Well, it was, and somebody we all know, well, some for all of us know who it was about. Uh, it, it was, it was, a, it was, um, it was about a friend of mine. Uh, we all did our substance abuses back then, uh, but this one person that uh, we used to hang around with uh, was kind of taking it to another level. And for some reason, I just sort of started writing a song about, you know, uh, why are you going to these extremes? Uh, uh, and uh, I didn't want to call it off of his name, so I, I made up Jackie Blue Although the blue part was pretty close, so and when, when we went into the studio to record it, Glenn Johns heard me sing it one time, and he brought me into the control room. He said, "What's this song about?" And I told him, and he went, "No, no, no, no. It's got to be about a girl." I mean, and and you know, it, it may have made a big difference to do that. So you know, Steve and I just went back into another studio and. And, you know, 45 minutes, we just sort of made up a story about some girl that's, you know, well, I don't even know what it's about, you know, and I wrote it. <laughs> Any other questions? Oh, we got a question. Hold on. Mike Smith with a question. No? You were just waving me off? Oh, okay. 
Any other questions? They just heard. They just heard us playing it. They, Brewery Shipley was managed by the same management company that we ended up getting, so uh, we played a bunch of shows with them, and uh, they just liked that song, so they cut a version of it. You know. Well, Larry, we can't thank you enough. We've had a wonderful time well, with you tonight. Thank you guys. Appreciate it. And thank you very much to Kurt Hargis for a great MC job. I know that you'll stick around. Yeah, I have some stuff I'll just leave up here. Anybody wants to kind of, there's some old pictures of the seven days. This is a picture of Mike Bungie, Bill Jones, and me playing a talent assembly at Glendale High School. And this is uh, Louis in the Seven Days getting ready to go to Vietnam. And then there's some pictures of uh, Granny's Bathwater and a few, and my dad, and a few other odds and ends. And then this book that I made, my dad. That's my dad. He used to do little theater. Yeah, no. Fiddler on the roof. Fiddler on the roof, exactly. Yeah. So anyway, you're welcome to wander around, look at this. I'll sit with anybody that has any questions or anything. I'm not in a hurry. Game's over. <laughs> Thank you very much.